Thank you. Good afternoon. It's great to be with you. I'm glad to see that there's a, uh, at least one universal when I go there and speak to federal societies uh, around, around the country, and that is food. <laughs> uh, and we were noting earlier the degree to which Chinese food seems to be a great theme with uh, studies of the law. I don't, I don't know the answer to that one yet. Uh, what I'd like to do for uh, this afternoon is speak for not more than 30 minutes, not necessarily in a formal speech, but in some, some uh, a, a little, little talk to talk about uh, another aspect of constitutionalism, which is say, rather than talking about the formal aspects of it, which is what you spend your time mostly studying in a law school, um, I want to talk about constitutional in the sense of, of, of how a people constitutes themselves, the broader sense of the word constitute, uh, and look at it from the point of view of history, especially the history of some political ideas that shape uh, America, that become an issue of debate, and I would suggest to you are the issue, really, uh, in today's, today's debate. Let me, let me start by uh, telling the story one of my favorite stories from the uh, American founding of a young man named Levi Preston. Uh, Levi Preston was in his 20s, actually the, younger than his 20s, uh, and was at the Battle of Concord in Massachusetts. This is one of those events which uh, we're all very familiar with and we know exactly what happened. Uh, he came out uh, and fought that day and later he gave an interview to a historian. And the historian wanted to ask him uh, why he had actually gone out and fought in that battle. Uh, at the time, of course, we didn't know what the outcome of that would be, nor did we know the outcome of the American Revolution, nor any of the other events surrounding it. Indeed, uh, Preston was one of a few young men uh, who actually went out at that battle uh, and aggressively challenged and fired upon the most powerful and the greatest military force uh, in the world who at the time was in complete control of the continent, uh, the, the colonies and the, the United States. So this historian asked Preston, why exactly did you go out and fight against the British? Surely it was the intolerable laws being passed by Parliament like the Stamp Act. He said, I never saw any stamps. Well, surely it was the Tea Act. I didn't drink tea, he said. How about your reading of Harrington, and Sidney, and Locke, and all the great treatises of political thought? I didn't read any of those. All I read was the Catechism, uh, the Bible, the Psalms, maybe. Well, what was it the interviewer asked? At this point, the historian, as historians are wont to do, is getting frustrated. Why, why did you take up arms against the British? And Preston said it was actually quite simple. You see, we had always governed ourselves we always intended to govern ourselves, and the British didn't mean us to govern ourselves. One reason I like that story is that too often we complicate our studies of questions, whether it's historical questions, uh, questions of political thought, questions of the law, and as a result, we sometimes miss the larger narrative, the larger meaning of those things. Uh, and I'm wondering whether this is one of those cases. The other reason I like that story is because it does point to what I think was the key question behind this whole movement in the establishment of the United States, which is this question of self-government. Indeed, all the great principles that I want to talk about a little bit really culminate in this idea of self-government, which is a complete, unique concept. Let me mention uh, Speaking of, of that, uh, a few other things coming into the American founding and make my case for this concept of self-government. If we look at the great influences coming into the American founding, one of the most important, which I'm sure you've thought about, is British constitutionalism. Right? The, the notion of the rule of law, going all the way back to, to Magna Carta, uh, developing through the various pieces of legislation passed by Parliament uh, to establish the rule of law, to protect certain rights of Englishmen, uh, what we would say, or we used to call, due process. Uh, in the Americans, okay, in the context of the Americans, those ideas of British constitutionalism developed further into written constitutionalism. Uh, the rule of law represented by the supreme law of the land, or constitution. But that Britishness of the Americans comes into being and is different in the American colonies and is shaped, secondly, 
by what we may call the moderate enlightenment, which is to say that the British argument wasn't sufficient. It also required, and in America allows for the development of this more moderate enlightenment argument, which you get in folks like Locke, and Sidney, uh, Harrington, uh, William Blackstone, his commentaries on law, which is that the English argument of traditional liberties was not sufficient for the Americans. They believed that behind those arguments for liberties was a broader argument of, of rights. Rights not merely because they were British, but because they were the rights of everyone and anyone, anywhere. They looked to a grounding of those rights in the concept of nature, equality, uh, consent, natural rights. So it's the familiar arguments of someone like a John Locke, which we see reflected in the Declaration of Independence. Uh, but those concepts of this moderate enlightenment are further shaped by uh, the religious influences on the American founders. That is, their moral horizons, which shaped a concept of religious liberty for sure, which is a, a non-sectarian uh, religious liberty of free exercise, but it also shaped a certain theological grounding of those rights, which are their inherited liberties understood to be grounded in a concept of rights coming from nature, an understanding of nature which is then in turn grounded much more theologically. And all that plays out in the American experience of self-government. Recall that uh, for the long period of time, up to the end of the French and Indian War, the Americans had what Burke famously called uh, been overseen by the British policy of benign neglect. The British left them alone to rule themselves to figure out their own institutions. They had their own, uh, their own legislatures, their own laws, their own tax policies. But they also learned how the institution of self-government should operate in light of these precursor ideas of constitutionalism, of rights, uh, and of religious liberty. It was after 1763, the end of the French Indian War, when the British started getting more interested in the American colonies. Among other things, look to the American colonies as a way to raise taxes. And here you will call all the various pieces of legislation the British passed to, to do those, including the Tea, the tea Act uh, and the taxation on tea. But what happens is between 1763 and 1776, the Americans transfer from loyal British subjects into uh, revolutionary Toronto's purses grounding a new argument on this concept of constitutionalism, rights, uh, religious liberty, self-government. The principles I lay out in my book, uh, which is not necessarily an invention, but just a, a, a general laying out of, of, I think, what the core principles of the American founding are, start with the concept of, of liberty. That is, for the American founders, for the thinkers that influenced the founding, uh, for those uh, that actually carry out the ideas of the founders, the main concept was the idea of human liberty. And here I note that they used the Latin word for liberty as opposed to the Germanic word freedom. That is, they had a certain concept of responsible liberty, which they saw playing out through, among other things, constitutionalism. The ideas of equality, natural rights, the consent of the governed, religious liberty itself, which we would add to that list property rights, private property rights. Uh, for the Americans, the concept of private property rights was a natural right, uh, but also a fundamental right grounded in their practice of, of liberty. Because one had the freedom to not only labor, but had a right to the fruit of one's labor. Those are the foundational rights of the American argument, to which we can add the architecture of liberty the rule of law, the old British concept of the rule of law, and the American, unique American concept of constitutionalism, which we normally and rightly associate with the idea of delegating power uh, through the Constitution, through the, various, through the various branches of the federal government, of enumerated powers, those branches, especially in Article I, things like the separation of powers, representation, federalism, various auxiliary precautions Madison talks about. Independence, the question of what America's principles mean in the world, and then this question of self-government, which in many ways is the culminating principle of all these other things. That is, the reason for which we create 
a limited government grounded in individual rights is to create a flourishing private society in which we can govern ourselves. But in this, the Americans meant it in two ways. One is self-governing of the people in a political sense, but also self-governing as individuals in the moral sense of the word. In that way, we would ensure what they call the blessings of liberty, preamble to the Constitution. Now, this question of, of virtue, of character, was one that is most associated with the anti-federalists, the critics of the Constitution, who believed that, among other things, uh, moral corruption was inevitable. And as a result, you can only have small republics uh, and agrarian citizens. But the federalist advocates of the Constitution were deeply concerned with these questions, the maintenance of some sort of civic virtue. They also had a very realistic assessment of the weaknesses of human nature. The difference is not only that they recognize man's interests and weaknesses, but design institutions of government to try to recognize that fact. We're all mostly familiar with uh, Madison's argument in Federalist 10. They create a structure of government, in a sense of a republic, but a republic that would supply what they call the defect of better motives. Hence all the auxiliary precautions. But at the end of the day, it's still dependent on this dependence on the people, which implied and necessitated a self-governing republic. People could only govern themselves if they first knew how to govern their own passions. As there is a degree of depravity in mankind which requires a certain degree of circumspection and distrust, Madison writes in Federalist 55, so there are other qualities in human nature which justify a certain portion of esteem and confidence. Republican governments presupposes the existence of these qualities in a higher degree than any other form. If the assessment of man's depravity were as bad as some claim, Madison continues, the inference would be that there is not sufficient virtue among men for self-government. And if that were so, Republican government would not be viable, and the American experiment of limited constitutionalism would be destined from the start to failure. Indeed, he concludes, if men were capable or incapable of moral self-restraint, then, quote, nothing less than the chains of despotism can restrain them from destroying and devouring one another. Now, the Americans in their writings emphasize various traits of this character. Just to mention four briefly that they mostly talked about. Self-reliance, the notion of being responsible for one's own well-being, as well as one's family, neighbors, and community. The idea of an assertive and spirited citizenry, possessing what Madison described as a vigilant and manly spirit that actuates the people of America. They also emphasized the notion of, of knowledge, civic knowledge, of our rights and responsibilities of citizenship, most famously described in the Washington First Annual Message. The ability to distinguish between oppression and the necessary exercise of lawful authority to know and to value your rights. And fourth, they valued and talked about at great length this notion of self-restraint, personal and public moderation. But the great question is, how would you actually establish and inculcate these characteristics? And here they did talk about the role of the law. The law does shape habits. And they believe that good laws would have a critical and salutary effect on political choices, encouraging things like responsibility, deliberation. The law, by permitting or restraining certain behaviors, does shape habits. An example is the national level would be the Northwest Ordinance, which set aside territory for schools and the purposes of religion. But there was a clear and final limit as to how directly this could be done at the national level. <laughs> national level could, national government could support moral virtue, for example, in opening sessions of Congress with prayer, for instance, <coughs> exhortation, presidential addresses, encouraging in a general non-sectarian support of, of religion, for instance. But its role was fundamentally limited, and these questions were the, uh, were the responsibility of state and local government. States traditionally had the power of uh, the police powers to protect and make laws having to do with things like health, welfare, education, morals of state residents. The objects of the federal government are few and defined, as he wrote Federal 45. The objects of the states, the ordinary course of affairs, concerning the lives, liberties, and properties of the people, 
in the internal order, improvement and prosperity of the state is actually quite extensive. And it's at that level that we see the founders' arguments for shaping uh, the moral character. I'll just mention some categories in general, uh, and then we'll move on from that. One, perhaps the most important from their point of view, is the question of education. It diffuses knowledge, but also shapes character. They were concerned about this, which is why they strongly supported general public education at the local level, paid for by government. Primary education was to focus on rudimentary elements of knowledge, for sure, but it was supposed to then go on and shape character, especially this question about knowing about your rights and the meaning of principles of liberty. I would encourage you to go back and read James Madison and Thomas Jefferson's curriculum for the University, University of Virginia's law school to get a great example of that. But most importantly, they turn to the institutions of private civil society. The question of morality, from their point of view, is a public concern. But that does not mean it should be addressed directly by public means, that is, government. The teaching and transmission of morality in the context of limited government, securing rights and individ protecting individual liberty, was primarily the job of various elements of society that were separate and independent of government. The institutions of civil society are more naturally suited for this and better at it in the first place. There are great examples of this, one being the question of public welfare. They did argue, actually argue in the early republic for a minimal safety net, but otherwise left it to individuals to work and to serve or take care of themselves, but also supported and greatly encouraged private associations to help them do that. They also encouraged and greatly uh, emphasized the role of religion in private in, in society, the centrality of religion, even in public discourse. Encouraging, most famously, the Washington Farewell Address, these great pillars of human happiness. They also saw religion playing a key role in education itself. And lastly, they emphasized and talked about the role of the institution of the family as the first and most important pre-political institution of civil society. And they write about it using the classic uh, Cicero's uh, reference to the family as the nursery of the Republic, of the Commonwealth, which they translated as the seminary of the Republic. But you don't see this argument in their public uh, documents as much, it wasn't an issue of the day, but you do see it in various treatises on law and legal questions. Referring to that, quote, important and respectable, though small and sometimes neglected establishment, which is denominated the family, James Wilson writes in his lectures on law, the family is the principle of the community. It is that seminary in which the commonwealth, for its manners as well as its numbers, must ultimately depend. And its establishment is the source, so it is the happiness of every institution of government which is wise and good. Now, these principles of the founders, this laying out of this argument, limited government, of certain rights of liberty, and a, a flourishing civil society with private institutions which shape moral character, comes under criticism after the American Civil War. That's the time when public intellectuals of the day decided that the American constitutional system had failed, and they looked elsewhere, most famously looking to uh, uh, Britain, France, but most importantly, uh, German thinkers of the day. And based on what they learned there of historicism and relativism, came back and launched what became known as the progressive movement. Their notion was not of permanent rights grounded in nature, the founders' argument, but essentially evolving rights, one formed by our Dar Darwinian understanding of man. They also had a notion of a new form of government, which would not be uh, controlled and, and uh, dealt with by delegations of powers and things like constitutions, but would be inherently administrative, regulatory, run by experts and bureaucrats who knew how to do things better, and it would be fundamentally unlimited. It's only a matter of expediency, they argue, that would be the limits on government. And they most famously invented the co concept of the living constitution, uh, arguments like those of Oliver Wendell Holmes. They wouldn't get rid of the Constitution, it was too much, too important to the fabric of American uh, life, but instead open up questions about uh, reinterpreting it to mean different things. 
to, to adapt to the times and to evolve and grow uh, with the needs of the community. But to this, we also have to add the progressive argument of what they call the national community, which is to say the replacement of a decentralized nation of social institutions to a very centralized nation with new allegiances to a national community built around a progressive social state in the, in the office of what was called social justice. The most famous argument of this, you can see, is that of Herbert Crowley, the uh, author of The Promise of American Life. Um, and the federal government would serve as a regulatory power to bring about social outcomes. In economics, for sure, for income redistribution, welfare programs, but also serving to overcome the old order, these traditional institutions of private society, which would be seen as mere, merely based on values and privatized as much as possible, in favor of a great community, as John Dewey famously called it, later used in the term of the great society, especially through concepts of progressive education. Now, the dynamic of these two arguments, these two worldviews, if you will, and why I spent the time to lay them out, is played out over the course of the 20th century. Indeed, it's the debate between these two worldviews that largely shapes American political history over that time. The argument is laid out most clearly, uh, intellectually, by the progressives, the early progressives, who, among other things, uh, uh, amend the Constitution for the state, for the federal income tax, and direct the and senators, but most importantly, it's their writings that shape later thinkers. Uh, the New Deal is actually the period in which most of the modern state, many of the aspects of the modern state are brought into to being. The federal government's regulatory powers of the economy are expanded. But also you see the debate and the turning point in constitutional law having to do with the living constitution. And then we see it again under the auspices of the Great Society, which in many ways is the greatest expansion of the federal government in terms of its sheer activities and places where it's involved in American public life in new areas heretofore untouched by the federal government, education, uh, welfare, the environment. What happens is a huge crowding out of these institutions, these private institutions that the founders themselves wanted to emphasize. The argument for progressives when all of this is actually quite inevitable. This question was settled. Any reasonable person knows that we must have this expanding, growing administrative government. The problem, of course, is that we've reached a point where it's becoming increasingly obvious that it's unsustainable. Whether we are now entering a new era of reform is the current, current debate, which is why we're in the midst of a large public debate about the direction we are currently going. I would suggest the choice between these two, these two directions is one of continuing on a current path, which seems to be turning America into another nation like some other European nation, which is highly Europe, uh, bureaucratic, and centralized, secular, and weak. The other option, I think, is hewing back to, in some way, a sense of limited government based on certain principles that are unchanging, applied to the current circumstances. But it comes back to this question of self-government. Constitutional government, over the course of the 20th century, has been challenged by another argument, which is the role of bureaucrats and experts, the progressive notion that uh, others, unelected, perhaps acting without our consent, are better able to rule us. Which again points us back to Tocqueville's famous warning in the 19th century. Uh, he warned the end of democracy in America that if you actually combine a deep passion for egalitarianism, not equality as a principle to start with, but egalitarianism, if you combine that with an increasing centralization of all power in one place, uh, you could potentially get what he called a new form of despotism and warned of, in which the state becomes more like the parent and the citizen becomes more like the child. And it's most it's destructive of our liberty, <coughs> but it's especially destructive of our character, our self-governing character, because we no longer act like self-governing individuals, but instead become wards of the state or dependent, uh, even though we might keep certain basic liberties. So in our uh, arguments to restore a constitutionalism, we must keep in mind that not only is the living constitution at issue, and a better understanding of the nature of rights, which keeps government limited as well, but also it turns on this notion of the flourishing of the institutions of civil society underneath it. 
Indeed, I'll suggest to you that it's because of those institutions that you either take for granted or see as less important today. And the important role those institutions play from the very beginning is why the American founding was always referred to as an experiment. Recall Franklin's famous phrase when he departed the Constitutional Convention and was asked what form of government did you give us? A republic, uh, if you keep it. In closing, let me just refer to Washington's first inaugural address. The first president had given the first inaugural address under the new Constitution. Yet Washington only mentions the Constitution in passing. It refers to our great constitutional charter. But instead, he spends his time discussing the character of those who will make the law. And he argued that the foundation of national policy will be laid in the pure and immutable principles of private morality. Interesting argument for, for an American president to make. Why? Because he argued there is no truth more thoroughly established than there exists in the economy and course of nature an indissoluble union between virtue and happiness, between duty and advantage, between the genuine maxims of honest and magnanimous policy and the solid rewards of public prosperity and felicity. That is the argument there is a permanent connection between questions of moral character and the, and the precise goods of liberty that we are so value. And he also led him to conclude that the preservation of the sacred fire of liberty and the destiny, destiny of the Republican model of government are justly considered, perhaps deeply, perhaps finally staked on the experiment entrusted to the hands of the American people. So you have Washington, the first president under the, under the Constitution, arguing very forcefully for the role of character as the, as the groundwork upon which the Constitution is based. Thank you. We have time for questions, right? Plenty of time. <laughs> And given the topic that you more than enough there for uh, either differences or controversies, whatever it might be. So, uh, a lot of the, the, the reform or <coughs> damage that the rest of the movement did came to the mechanism of the courts. If you if you subscribe to natural right notions, what would you have um, law students heading into the the world of courts do? In other words, would you have the role of judges, for instance, be? Is that, is that too abstract, maybe? Uh, no, no, that's actually a, 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 a very good question. Is um, if kind of a natural rights argument undergirds the American argument more generally, um, how do we approach that given that many of the practical changes occur through the courts? Um, I, think, I think actually the answer that it tells us is that at the end of the day, the courts are limited in what they can do. In the same way the Constitution itself is limited, I think what we, the change you can bring about through courts, even in terms of reviving a limited Constitution, at a certain level are limited. Uh, the, the role of a, a someone who's studying the law, the role of a judge, is to focus on the powers delegated in the Constitution, that is constitutionalism. Um, what's important, perhaps not coming out in those judicial decisions, well, it does come out sometimes when you read uh, 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 certain justices, especially someone like Clarence Thomas, is that there's an argument made behind it. It's not that that argument has itself legal, legal meaning in a, in, a, in a way that can be uh, used in cases, but it's an undergirding argument behind it. The natural rights argument, the, the, the nature of rights, uh, and as well as the, the role of these institutions, I think plays out through how legislatures are act, then acting in light of having relimited constitutionalism uh, through the courts. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. If I understand you correctly, you believe that the founders' intention was to make the law to, to shape our character, that we should act uh, to shape our character in particular ways. If so, doesn't that itself clash with the very notion of liberty, which is that you can act as you please so long as you don't you know, directly harm someone else? But, um, their, their intention wasn't to create um, uh, a way of making laws to shape character directly. Right? It's indirectly that they thought 
this would be done. And, and it's lest they set out to do that, which would be kind of the, the argument uh, prior to the American founding, uh, whether it's through religious establishments or through forms of kind of platonic ways of shaping character directly, uh, they set out to create a nation based on liberty, which is that uh, individuals and communities had the freedom to act and govern themselves. <clears throat> Having said that, uh, they were not oblivious of, and I don't think we can believe it to be oblivious of the fact that uh, it's necessary for those individuals to learn how to govern themselves in a way that restrains their own passions, to be very practical, um, in, in the sense of acting in a way that allows for the project of self-government itself to proceed. Um, now, is that a violation of the principle of liberty? I think from their argument, the answer is no. But it also tends, turns on the fact that, from their perspective, uh, liberty did not mean the modern concept of doing whatever you wanted. Right? It meant you had to be responsible. It meant that the government would give you as much possible freedom to act, uh, to exercise that liberty, but you had a certain responsibility to act uh, reasonably. Now, how that would be shaped, however, is why they emphasized federalism, decentralization, down to the local level as much as possible, and actually back to families. Ultimately, shape the character in a much more powerful way, but also do it in a way that it is highly diverse and not through the institutions of government, because they understood government, especially the federal government, um, through its powers, uh, was a very blunt instrument at the very least and a very inefficient instrument to, to encourage care. Do you believe by today's definitions the founders, I mean, I know there's many founders, but uh, would they be considered libertarian? I, I don't mean to focus on particular issues like, you know, abortion or gay right. marriage or any war, but in general, just the concept of, like I said, free, uh, freedom so long as you don't harm or threaten to harm another person? Um, let me ask the question this way, because this, this question does come up. Uh, first thing we have to keep in mind is that the categories we use to describe political opinions today did not exist at the time of the American. I said by today's definition. No, I mean, it, it's important to, to, to think about that, which is to say that um, uh, the founders, in many ways, were, were a great mix of today's categories. As I can see in our where in many ways they're very libertarian. Uh, but in many ways, they're also members of the Christian right. Uh, but but the point, I think they saw this whole thing through a very different eye, which was the eye of constitutionalism, which shaped how all of these things. As a, as a practical matter, their libertarianism comes out in a very powerful, uh, principled argument for limited government as much as possible. Um, I would probably say on um, you know 80, not you know high high 80s, 90 percent of the time they would be classified as liber libertarians. Having said that, uh, I think it's very important to recognize that they weren't libertarians in principle, in terms of their own philosophy of things, uh, which is to say that they did recognize the importance of things that do shape moral character. But as much as possible, that should be done outside of government. Um, they didn't advoc advocate anarchy. They advocated reasonable government. At the low level, it did recognize the fact that government can shape and should shape character in a very direct way. Hence the idea of local governments, uh, county governments, uh, setting ages at which you can drink. From their point of view, that was very reasonable, and they had no problem with that. Uh, where it gets hard today, I think, does come to those particular questions, the harder moral questions, uh, that really cut to questions having to do with uh, human nature in a very direct way. Those are very hard questions as was the question, say, of slavery. Right? These, these really cut to very deep philosophical principles at the core of our liberty. Um, those questions are much harder to figure out where they would be, but I think the capitalists of thinking through it would be very different than one we used to. Um, you mentioned the effect of a uh, progressive movement on sort of weakening civil society institutions, but I'm wondering whether it also was a response to already weakening civil society institutions as a result of industrialization, urbanization, mass immigration, etc. And whether and how you would have, you think that um, the founders 
constitutional principles would respond to these economic and social evils in a way that differed from the uh, progressive movement? The, the, uh, no, you, you're absolutely right. What, what, what gives rise to the matter to much of the progressive movement is industrialization and changes in American society. Um, the distinction I would make is that there was uh, an actually a civil, civil society or a civil service reforms, other reforms in cities uh, that were adapting to precisely those things going on. Uh, large amounts of immigration, urbanization, industrialization. Um, the, the, the founders' constitution, in, in general, was perfectly capable of allowing for those adaptations. And there's nothing about the founders' constitution which actually allows a lot of flexibility, especially at the local level, state and local level, to adapt precisely to those things. What, what the progressives introduced, which was uh, a, a radical shift, um, and I, I emphasize the word radical, was they introduced um, a completely new philosophy of government. Because their argument was that industrialization, all these changes in society, which I would argue were practical changes at the time, uh, had fundamentally changed the very nature of government and opened up new possibilities. So they introduced a whole new philosophy of government, not based on trying to keep government limited, but allowing for it to solve and deal with problems. Um, but they argue that government could now actually become something to, to not only solve things, but bring around a new society in a much more radical, radical way, largely because of the advance of science, which had led to industrialization and things like that. They believe created a new science of government. Uh, and that science will allow for them to do more things from a centralized point of view, have much more uh, uh, kind of bureaucratic administrative approaches to doing things. That whole philosophy is radically different than the founders' philosophy. And my point in emphasizing how it actually also favored, uh, affected civil society institutions was to underscore the fact that the argument for limited government, it's like this, the old three-legged stool analogy, which is really overused, but uh, you know, not only is it limited government, but it's a certain understanding of rights grounded in nature, certain permanence to those rights as opposed to evolving rights. Uh, but also these institutions, the, these character-forming institutions, which were non-governmental but allowed for creative kind of character necessary for free government. They believe all those pieces were necessary. And it's no coincidence that progressism attacks and tries to break down all three of those things precisely to bring about a new and different way of, of, of government. Uh, going back to the evolving constitution thing, uh, would you say that Brown versus Board of Ed was a good decision? Um, the, 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 in what sense do you mean the question? Well, because uh, from an original standpoint, when the Fourth uh, Amendment was passed, uh, right. Uh, institutionalized segregation under the law was common practice, and so from the religious and the originalist standpoint, you mean the originalist from the Fourteenth Amendment standpoint, right? Looking, looking at when, looking at the time when that was passed, and the Brown can't really be justified without an evolving standards of decency or constitution. Uh, well, you know, you'd also make a distinction between the outcome, the decision in Brown, and the logic of which they got there. I mean, you know, Brown also uses this really strange psychological analysis. Uh, to go through its decisions. Um, I mean, look, the, 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 the notion of, of uh, where you see like, the, the clearest examples of, of kind of the living constitution argument is something in, in the, the use of, say, commerce. What is interstate commerce? And how that changes over time, such that, I mean, today, anything is commerce. Um, I mean, it's, 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 you see them opening up through, through, uh, through those avenues. Uh, I mean, the current debate over the health care bill is a perfect example, right? The notion of an individual mandate, uh, which is to say that a, the federal government having the power to uh, cause individuals who choose not to participate to enter a contract against their will is, is argued on the basis of commerce power. It's pretty hard to argue that one's choice not to participate in commerce is something that gives the federal government power to regulate it. I mean, it's, it's, it's this, the, the living constitutional argument, I think, is, is most um, uh, dangerous when you basically are using the Constitution to get where you want to go to. Um, I, mean, I mean, look, the, 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 uh, the 14th Amendment was meant to correct 
certain egregious problems throughout large parts of the United States in order to uh, guarantee equal protection and due process. I, I see that as being, being perfectly consistent. Um, using that then to later uh, you know, go places you wanted to go to bring about your outcomes, I think is, is much more problematic. Uh, I mean, you know, if you look at, if you read like active, uh, Breyer's Active Justice Law, you'll see a good example there, I think a very weak uh, living constitution argument that really doesn't take constitution seriously at all, virtually. But sees more following Brennan the, the notion the Constitution is merely uh, a statement of glittering generalities, and it's the job of the justice to uh, bring about the meaning of those generalities to get to outcomes they want to get to. Um, that's a very different, uh, different approach, uh, not from the founders, but I would argue from any any sense of constitutionalism, um, the adults elsewhere as well. Yeah. Question a little on the, the uh, Brown decision and how it involved a psychological analysis. And I think that kind of relates to your point about progressivism seeing scientific changes and trying to fold them into the concept of what government can and should do. What's the problem with doing that um, in your eye? Just evolving, having evolving standards when you know our understanding of science has evolved radically in the last few centuries. Our understanding of the human body and mind has changed radically. Uh, technology is changing the world. Industrialization. Most of our religions have evolved to a degree. Why shouldn't our philosophy of government? change right along with all those other things that are you know, equally but, vital. But the key question, of course, is who ought to do it? Right? The founders argument would, 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 was that uh, the Constitution was supposed to um, give some permanence to how we operate as a framework. But underneath that, you allowed for legislatures to debate these questions and decide how to go forward. Um, and through their, uh, their actions, um, change what these things meant, and the courts would serve the purpose of making sure that you stay generally within the, the uh, framework of the Constitution, and if necessary, um, creates the necessity of amending the Constitution. Which is to say that you allow for that change, we want that change, that's our sovereign right, uh, but it's done through a way that is consistent with the idea of the consent of the governed, and this concept of self-government. Right? The problem we have today, and the, the real evil, I would suggest, the progressive argument, is that um, it is so infused with this notion of, of um, kind of a certain scientism, a science of jurisprudence, that um, it dispenses with consent and self-government. really isn't is interested in those things. If there's, if, if they're so convinced that the, the facts themselves necessitate a certain outcome. Could you give an example? Uh, Deciding that, uh, you know, we, uh, the, the, the argument that uh, what is um, considered capital punishment should be subject to the evolving standards of time. That's just not a course decision to make. The, the, the job of the jurist is, is not to amend, essentially amend the Constitution to bring about what they think is the evolving change regardless of how much science they think is behind it. Right? Those are policy questions that I would suggest are more the, the natural purview of legislatures. If the Constitution is not sufficient to allow for that change, then you amend the Constitution. Simple as that. Um, once you get outside of that framework, whether you like it or not, and whether you agree with those progressive outcomes or not, once you get outside of that framework, we've left the context in which we have Great friend, both we're going to govern ourselves. So who's to say the next guy that might come along might have a very different view of where that science ought to take us? I mean, look, you know, the, the, the uh, science about um, uh, DNA, cloning, is very complicated, but also raises very difficult and controversial questions about the nature of humanity. Well, I'll be perfectly honest, one way or the other, I'm not sure I want, you know, nine justices making that decision. I would much per rather prefer a very broad-based discussion within the framework of constitutional government, which is a few legislatures, uh, to, to deal with that.
One example that just comes to mind and answers Jordan's question is uh, and no doubt the greatest progressive justices all went to Holmes, and no greatest um, best use of science was with the Buck v. Bell case when he upheld sterilization of mentally retarded people. That was that was that was the progressive science. That was the science of the day. It was eugenics. And he had that famous line, and probably one of the most infamous lines in Supreme Court history, that three generations of imbeciles are enough. So this is cutting edge science applying the pressing social problems today. The danger, of course, is that science evolved, and now eugenics is seen as a disgusting uh, pseudo Nazi kind of thing. But once you depart from the notion that humans are equal eternally, um, once you depart from those self evident truths, it becomes, you enter sort of perilous territories. There's nothing to ground us from. Um, detours into science, which is often pseudoscience. Yeah, everything, everything comes up, up for grabs, uh, which isn't necessarily to say that it would go one way or the other, but I mean, that's precisely why you create a constitution which differ, with different branches of government, one of which, going through legislatures, is, this, is, is the superior way of, <coughs> of having precisely those <coughs> kinds of debates. Um, it's not the job of justices to make those to make those decisions. Um, and only, only really until you, you get to the progressives do you get that kind of argument um, coming out. And, and, and Holmes, when you read his his, uh, his work on the common law uh, and his arguments about how uh, constitutional law should become a form of common law infused by this notion of uh, progressive science, right, uh, it's only then that you get this argument that Really, what the Constitution is 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 the the evolution over time of judicial decisions as as we ju the justices guide us towards ever ever more and better notions of progress. Um, now, one might like where that's going right now, but once you've gotten away from that framework, I, I see no uh, among other things, I don't see much legitimacy to it. Uh, but also, I, I think it starts raising very serious questions about the, the core principles behind the, the notions of, of uh, constitutional government in the first place. Um, I'm just wondering where your argument goes practically. Um, from what I understood, you're not, you don't seem to be saying that uh, the progressive changes to the way we govern, or the way the federal government governs, um, were unconstitutional per se, but they're more that they were inconsistent with the Founders' political philosophy or maybe the spirit of the Constitution. Um, and since we're on Oliver Wendell Holmes, I guess, a lot, um, to paraphrase, uh, he said, if the people want to go to hell, then it's my job to help them get there. Um, underlying the framers' uh, political philosophy, I would imagine, is this very strong notion of uh, politi uh, political equality and inherent uh, moral political worth of the individual. And if the people um, have decided to legislate and possibly even surreptitiously create a constitutional change which creates this new um, kind of administrative government, um, practically, what's, wh where do you see that uh, as, as going wrong, or what do you see the <coughs> remedy for that? Well, I, first of all, I, I didn't, uh, uh, if I did, I did not want to imply that what the progressives did was somehow constitutional. Right. What I was suggesting that it goes beyond the, the, the legal question of its constitutionality to, to include a deeper philosophical um, <coughs> unconstitutionality uh, of the whole system. Um, the, the how, how the courts uh, have dealt with over time uh, with changing the meaning of things like you know commerce over as it's evolved over time, I, I think is deeply taking the Constitution uh, in ways that were radically different from how it was originally intended. Um, problem with Holmes' argument, again, goes back to the practical point, which is that um, his notion of uh, what the people might want does not give him legitimate authority to take them there as a justice. It might give him um, uh, an argument that he can use in another context, uh, in a political context. Uh, but it doesn't give him the, the right nor the power to bring that about as an outcome through judicial policy making. That's precisely what he advocated. Um, the broader question, which I think is more difficult, which you also imply, is that uh, what happens over time if, in many cases through legislation, 
uh, the, the, uh, the law has come to include several things that we might in hindsight look back and see as constitutional problems that have now become well established over time. Right? That's kind of the working point. Um, how, do you, how do you push back against that? Well, my, my, my general observation is that the fact of the matter is that there are vast aspects of this which won't be turned back. The government noise has been, has been changed uh, in how it, it operates. But that shouldn't prevent us from recognizing the radical change and its constitutional nature as problematic as it is. Uh, because only by hewing to those core principles, I think we can figure out how to push back against it and where it can be changed, uh, changed for the better. Yeah. On that point, do you think that we're beyond a, a point of no return in terms of being wards of the state? You mentioned that as well. Oh, no, not, not at all. Not at all. Matter of fact, I think, but I, I think we're actually in a, in a period where, um, and actually right now it's, it's very good because there's actually more and more people raising this question. It, it is time to think about it. I mean, you know, you, you, we're at a point where uh, I think it's like 30 some percent um, uh, of, of the American people. Uh, could be called, in some loose meaning of the word, dependent, in the sense that they get um, sufficient amounts from the state that they're literally dependent on it for their day-to-day -day living. Um, now, some of that might be for new reasons, some of that might be for problematic reasons, some of it might be an inappropriate at the level of the state. Um, but yeah, I don't think we're at all past that. Um, I, think, uh, I think where it gets more difficult is the extent to which we have centralized authority and we have uh, shifted much of that authority actually away from legislatures. One of the, th the additional problems you get beginning with progressive, but especially later into, into other uh, more recent periods is the extent to which legislature, legislatures have been delegating their powers to administrative agencies and bureaucracies. Uh, setting aside the, the constitutional problem <coughs> of delegating power um, is a practical matter um, I think it does take away and undermine the whole notion of legislating and governing ourselves. Um, pushing back from that, I think, is still within the realm of poss the possible. Most of the expansion of the administrative state only occurs, say, since the 1970s. It's a practical matter. Um, but, it, uh, but it will be difficult um, as long as uh, it's not more broadly realized and affected through political change, which is, say, through legislatures, uh, especially federal legislatures. Um, how much of an obstacle do you think things like uh, you know, popular apathy in the public or um, and also factionalism? How much of an obstacle are those things to getting or achieving decentralization? Um, by, by factionalism, you mean kind of special interests right. and all the people who actually run Washington, that kind of thing? Uh, um, well, I, I mean, look, it's it's. Part of the problem, I think, uh, and I, I'm, I'm, it's always bad to say these things in the context of law school, I suppose, is that um, we, we've turned the Constitution too much into a legal document. Uh, and I say that not as a criticism of the, of the serious legal questions involved in the Constitution, but in the sense that uh, for many of the American people, we've treated the Constitution as a legal document for so long that they are less likely to see it as something they ought to be concerned about. Um, having said that, I mean, if you think we're in the middle of a period of apathy, I mean, look how many people are involved on both the left and the right in the big questions going on now in, in, in American, uh, American politics. I mean, who would have thought that uh, the, the, the amount of people engaged in a debate over a very large and complicated piece of legislation uh, would be out actively on, on both sides debating about it? That strikes me that um, while many people are, are normally apathetic, they can often be engaged, which is a, is a, is a healthy sign. Um, I think the way to break uh, how Washington works is, is politically, which is that you bring in new, uh, new members, new legislators, and you, you, you change it. Um, what we're seeing, and I think uh, President Obama is dealing with this problem as much as uh, his conservative critics, is that it's very difficult to do that through the existing apparatus. I mean, one of the reasons why President Obama appoints these quote unquote czars um, uh, is because he's trying to figure out how to get control of his own administrative bureaucracy. 
and he can't do it through the existing um, powers given to him through congressional law, so he has these um, other individuals to try to shape it. It's extremely difficult to get a hold of those things. Um, I, I think we're actually entering a period in which there's going to be a pretty healthy political debate uh, about the direction and the, the nature of those questions. And my guess is the political party who's better at arguing that matter one way or the other will be more successful. And we actually might be an interesting point, the point when you can push that back to some extent. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> this may be a little beyond the scope of this talk, but considering the other uh, gentleman there mentioned the 14th Amendment, I know today's the oral arguments for the, uh, for the Second Amendment incorporation case. I'm wondering what you think of that, or incorporation in general, the debt doctrine of the incorporation through the 14th Amendment. Um, well, I mean, the, the, the one thing that I think is the clearest, at least looking at it from the founder's perspective, which I'm <coughs> the most familiar with, is um, uh, there are extensive uh, documents and letters and writings, legal and otherwise, in which they clearly make the argument that the, 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 um, there is a natural right to possess firearms. Um, largely because uh, the individual possesses, at the end of the day, the right, what's called the right of revolution, which is the ability to defend yourself and your family, but also ward off the state. Um, as, is, as is necessary, so you keep that right, it's a natural right. Um, and I think that if there is right for any of those amendments having that status, it's the second amendment. Um, the argument of incorporation is a much more general and problematic matter. I mean, the Bill of Rights initially was clearly meant to only be limits on the federal government. Uh, not a limits on the state, and its meaning has been completely flipped around so that now it gives the uh, Supreme Court uh, the easy ability to apply those rights to, to, uh, uh, to the states in a way that's radically different from how the founders thought it, uh, it should operate. Um, and the founders' argument was that uh, the best place for a Bill of Rights in the, in the broad sense which we treat the Federal Bill of Rights nowadays the best place for that notion of Bill of Rights was at the state level, where most states had Bill of Rights, which were very extensive and powerful in that way. Uh, and the federal one was really more of a limitation on, on the federal government uh, itself. But even just more generally, I think it's important to understand the extent to which the founders emphasized the structural components of the Constitution as a way to, to limit government. So, thanks. Is that your time? I think that's it, yeah. Great, thank you.